This week on the show we're joined by Jim Marsden, film photographer extraordinaire. We talk about his cameras, his kit and his process for shooting film commercially. If you'd like to skip the uh, intro waffle, why would you? But if you do, uh, jump in around the 20 minute mark. Hello everyone, uh, I hope you've missed us. We've missed you. So it's been a while, and I've been desperately trying to get hold of Greg. And it's been what? I mean, it's probably what, it's been seven seven months. Has it been since we did the last one? Yeah, something like that. It's, um, it's yeah, I've been a while. No, we've we've both been been rather busy. Uh, and, with life. Well, and you've been screening my calls. That's true. Um, so that's a bit a bit awkward. What my lawyer advised to be to be fair, <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, who is the name of your lawyer? I, I could do with one. Uh, there's a guy called Saul Goodman. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I better, I better call Saul. <laughs> um, how are you doing? It has been seven months since we've even uttered a word to each other. I've missed you. Yeah, I'm not too bad. I might sound a bit different. I don't know if I sound at all different this week. You do. You do sound a bit different. Is there? Is there a particular? Is there a particular reason? Nice segue. I think uh, it's, pa- it's partly the lovely bass that is being um, given to my vocal cords by a little friend called COVID. Um, and secondly, my new studio base uh, for, the, for the foreseeable, which is in Kingston, Jamaica. So yeah. <laughs> I am coming it's, to you from my hotel room in isolation. Yeah, it's not, it's not been quite the trip you'd planned. No. <laughs> Let's just say the words fucking cluster come to mind, but not in that order. Um, can we say that? Yes, we can. It's our podcast. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. People. We can say whatever the hell we want. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, uh, well, where to begin? Um, flew out to Jamaica to do a job, a uh, five day shoot. Um, had my. Uh, Tests all last week, started to get a bit of a sore throat, but was, you know, Laurie's back in nursery, so that's kind of quite normal. Tests were coming back negative, had a PCR test, came back negative on the Friday, did a lateral flow on the Saturday, which was negative, flew on the Sunday, and took all day traveling, like nine hour flight, three hours driving, got to the hotel Monday morning. Another lateral flow, positive. <laughs> Shoot's due to start on Tuesday. So there's a 70 uh, strong team out here, um, mainly local team, um, because it's also a video shoot as well as a still shoot. Mm-hmm. And suddenly I'm out of the game. So that's tough. Panic stations, trying to help the client find a replacement all this kind of stuff and um yeah shoots started today i'm obviously not part of it currently sat in my hotel room for the foreseeable trying to uh get the all clear to be able to actually go home at some point i mean minus, that also minus the job and the money minus the job and the money on a, on a plus note you get to talk to me which that has taken true. me seven months to organize that is true. It took COVID and flying to the other side of the world to finally have time. No. That's it. Um, it focused the mind. It, it made me realise what was important in life, Tom. That's it. And it was our That's listeners. It. Exactly. You. You, hear, you hear that, dear <laughs> listeners? Not me. Oh, brutal. Okay, fine. Take the listeners over me. I understand how it is. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, though, to be fair, we've been trying, haven't we, for a while to do this. And... Um, we were really keen to kind of make season two happen. Um, you know, uh, we've had lots of people reaching out and sharing the love. So we really wanted to try and bring it back for everyone. But um, it has become you... harder because the world is, you know, opening up a little bit more. However, as my current predicament shows, you know, here we are um, two years on from when we first started this pod, you know, in the middle of the, well, the beginning of the first lockdown, kind of, you know, realizing something was happening and it wasn't good and we're still dealing with it, you know. Mm. Um, I'm sat in a hotel room with a sore throat um, and, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's it. 
but it's a highly contagious disease and I can't risk kind of exposing other people to it. So I have to sit here and not talk to me, not work, which for us freelancers is, is, is a bit crap. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. And no, I, I, I really feel for you when you, when you text me this morning, I was just like, you have got to be kidding me. That can't, that can't actually be your situation, but no, Unfortunately, yeah. it is, and that's you know literally this is... the worst, the mm. worst timing. I've spent two years avoiding COVID, mm. and then it came the day before, you know, a shoot. It's just anyway. Anyway, let's not start on a downer. No, well, I mean, look, you 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 touched upon you touched upon it. A few things you'll notice are, are going to be different um, this season. Number one is we're on video now so mm. we're not entirely sure how that's going to work but i even went and got a haircut for you guys so you know it's actually a pretty good it's a pretty dashing haircut i gotta say i you even know, got my so small annoying, headphones in we, we you know all well, the entire last season we we kind of prof- you know we were professional every week with our matching black and white profiles you know speaking to oh, the guests yeah. and now i'm coming beaming to you from a i mean i nearly did this in the shower cubicle for sound issues <laughs> I mean, Which would I have made a really I'm, interesting video for the. Listeners. I mean, yeah, right, <laughs> with the shower on. No, I'm, I'm really, I'm quite gutted you haven't coated yourself in a duvet, gone for yeah. the ultimate. Um, I think Ben Nash, one of our guests from the first yeah. season, created a polyboard fort, didn't he? He did. So Sadly, I'm a little upset. I mean, because well, there's a reason for that, Tom. Um, for uh, to save our listeners having to hear the humdrum of my aircon, I don't have the aircon on, so I'm sat here with sweat trickling down my back. And so the last thing I need is a duvet over my head. Craig, that's quite the vision. I mean, you want to make sure our listeners aren't getting too hot under the collar. <laughs> <laughs> if, if they Sorry, could see you, me, they wouldn't be. Don't worry. You are listening to the Exposed <laughs> Negative After Dark. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's but it, you know, in all honesty, things are going to be a little bit different in this uh, in this season. We are going to be, you know, the trouble is with this podcast is you are speaking or you're not speaking to, but you're hearing from two, well, one quite dull person and Greg. So you know, the the, the issue really is that we are we're quite busy. The the tr- and what I've really learned is that you know all, a lot of the other. I don't want, to, don't want to sound like bad, but there are a lot of people who run podcasts who maybe aren't as busy in photography as we are. And so it's nice to be back being busy, but at the same time, you're going to have to try and bear with us a little bit because we are determined to get this done and create these episodes for you, but they're just going to have to fit in around our schedule. So we are going to get them done as and when, but there might be little breakdowns in sound quality from time to time because we're probably mm. going to have to record, you know, like you are at the moment, even though I do think you sound dashing, um, you know. And so this is more just a please bear with us. We really want to keep creating the exposed negative, um, and we are going to because mm. I think when you said it earlier, you were like, well, you know, we really wanted, did want to start season two, but... No, we are. We really want to do season two, um, and we are going to. Um, but it well, we have, just... we, you know, without giving too much away, we have three cracking <gasps> episodes. Spoiler lined up. Spoilers, Greg. This oh, is yeah. meant to be impromptu. We're not meant to have anything lined up or in the bank. Right. Just a little, oh, uh, a little teaser, a little, little tickle, <laughs> a little tickle. Anyway, you can tell we're we're both a bit out of practice because we are currently making baby noises down the. Uh, <laughs> and each other. Um, but yeah so that, that's the plan we are going to be doing it and they are going to be sporadic i think rather than stuck to a schedule so keep your eye on your podcast services and also follow us on instagram we are obviously on there at, at x negative um and we'll be announcing everything on on the social media and on the website the social well. media the social media. All right, uh, by the way, that. I sounded 75 years old. Come and catch us on the Instagram and give us a follow. If you can't find us, look us up on the Googly. <laughs> but, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, well, so welcome I, back. I, I'm excited. I'm really excited. And um, I, I have to say, didn't we? I can't remember if this was on air or if this was just a gentleman's agreement between us. But um, I believe at the end of last season, there was some chat about you and kit and never buying 
any more kit and if you did i had permission to publicly shame you or something yeah i'm not sure so i, I ever, just thought i don't know i just want to check in i mean uh, did you... did we ever specify a limit on <laughs> the amount of kit i could buy <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that's basically what listeners are, are tuning in for, is to find out what Tom's bought this week. I've, They've I've got seven been, months of catching up to do. <laughs> look, I've been in the past seven months. You changed what did camera I call systems. <laughs> no, I good. haven't changed cameras. I'm genuinely really happy still with the Canon R5 and stuff. I'm good. Like, for the first time since I sold my 5DS, I'm genuinely happy. And I'm really pleased with the work well, I'm putting life. out. Oh, yeah, just, just in ge- just in general. I mean, life's okay. great, but you know, with the camera system, obviously. Yeah. But I I can't remember what I've. I don't think I've bought any equipment. Hmm. What was that in, big? Um, what was that? I think you bought some lights. Didn't you? Some lights. Ah. Oh, D yeah, something. Did, yeah. Oh. Pro oh, something. is it? Been, has Fendo it been that? Something. Has it been that long? Yeah. So but also, yeah. There, there was actually one specific bit of kit uh, I did want to ask you about. Which one? <laughs> What's that big battery that you bought? Oh, de- well, Greg, I'm very glad you asked. I'm, I think we should do this. We should we should probably have this bit on the Instagram stories because I actually have it here. <laughs> <laughs> to listen whilst Tom gives himself a hernia. Oh, here we go. Blimey! It looks like a little robot. Look at it compared to the size or of Or a ghetto head. blaster. <laughs> there we go. It's a, it's is the that how you size. run it on your shoulder? <clears throat> like an Absolutely. 80s? Oh, God almighty. So it's 15 kilos, but wow. it's this is the EcoFlow Delta. And one of our previous guests, LS, uh, Limonus, uh, uh, told me about it. And EcoFlow Delta. EcoFlow Delta. I think I paid, oh, for the life of me, I can't remember how much it was, about 1,300 quid for it. Okay, and the cool thing about it is, it runs pretty much anything that I've got. Mm. So I bought, you know, when you were talking about those D Profoto lights, I bought three D what a D two one thousands, and it runs all three of them at full power for hours. Wow! It's See, got I'm a thirty three hundred watt surge. It suddenly makes. I mean, obviously, you know, you need to be traveling to the location with your own transport. Unless you mm-hmm. want to lug around a fifteen kilo expensive sandbag, which doesn't um, sound heavy until you carry it for like longer no, than two minutes. A fifteen then, kilos is basically the the weight of a normal kind of you know camera backpack for the cameras, really, isn't it? About yeah, it's probably it's heavier. Heavy. In fact, it, it is pretty heavy. <laughs> it's basically what your luggage allowance for the hold is when you get an EasyJet flight. That's uh, yes, a good way. A PSA: it. you cannot fly these. <laughs> absolutely absolutely no way if you turn so, up with one of these at the airport they are going to be like nope we're closing the airport we're done yeah we're out of here so, no more flights uh, so the um i'm interested in it because uh i wanted to run a hazer on a job recently like a smoke mm-hmm. machine and obviously that would be perfect for it but i guess it would also be great for running you know things like the aperture lights on set when you're on location, yep. if you don't want to mm-hmm. run them off VLOX, because you know you, mm-hmm. the VLOX are well, if you get VLOX are big enough to run that, you're looking at 200, 300 a pop for each VLOX. You probably need a couple of them. Well, right? that's if you get the cheap ones as well. I mean, here's the here's the issue, right? If you're running, uh, oh, here we go with the tech talk. If you are <laughs> running, say for example, you run the Aperture 300X, which is one of the lights I have, mm-hmm. um, and you are running it on two, it's a 300 watt draw, right? so roughly um and and all these figures are are very rough so if you've got a 300 watt draw and then you've got two 150 watt hour batteries you're roughly going to run that light for about an hour at full at full power Mm. this ecoflow delta will run it for about four and a half five hours it's a almost a 1300 watt hour battery so it's pretty big um, wow. And also, the best thing about it is with VLOX, you know, none of them, I mean, some of them do have little screens and stuff, but this one actually gives you a full readout of how long it's going to be running that appliance at that output for. And it has Which obviously that when a, you're, so you have on the screen, it will show you each output and what appliance, like the, the thing for no, it doesn't, the it doesn't show you, it doesn't, no, it doesn't show you each, it doesn't show you each output, even though there are four AC They're outputs. Four, yeah, four. It'll only show you what the current load will last for. 
So okay. if you've got four yeah. lights or one light plugged in, it doesn't it doesn't kind of differentiate between the between the plugs. I don't think it does anyway. I've not seen that, but it will it'll run that. And I've actually weirdly, you know, I was doing a, a shoot for Channel Four um, a couple of weeks ago. I I'm not really I can probably say I did the shoot, but I'm not allowed to talk about it. Um, and we ran all of the lights other than the battery lights off this because i didn't we were kind of put in a corner of a studio it was it was alongside a a tv ad and Mm. i didn't want to have trailing cables and stuff and i was just like okay great well i'll take the eco flow i'll take the delta popped it in the corner job done yeah yeah yeah. and i just you know ran ran the the three d2s no, they weren't running at full power, to be fair, but we're running them all with the modeling lights. And I think it said that it was going to run them for six or seven hours. Because mm. um, it's amazing. Know, it's honestly, it's a, it's a, I bought it on a bit of a whim, thinking, I don't know if I'll ever use this. And I've used it a lot. I yeah, guess it's I've quite good if, if, if you're in a camper van and stuff like that as well. It'd be a great thing to take camping, wouldn't it? If you, oh, it, uh, go you, ca- you would car be, camping. You'd be everyone's best mate on a campsite with this because you everyone can charge their phones a hundred times over. You know, it's a it's mm. a really really big thing. What I've what I've also want to use it for is that behind me here, I've bought another client monitor and like an ISO. Um, and shout out to Jack Terry and Limanas for helping me get this um, getting this set up. But we've now got wireless HDMI sending from the Digi Plate to the client monitors and then we've also so we've got wireless going from <laughs> this is me saying i've not spent any money on kit so we've got wireless hdmi going from the macbook pro to an iso but also to two ipad pros that mm. are dotted dotted around set um and that's a really neat solution yeah um and the new ipad pros there's i don't know if you've seen the screen on them but they they yeah. are phenomenal yeah i use one for um uh, client screen there's a second screen it's fantastic yeah I, I with the wireless hdmi you do annoyingly get a little bar at the top and at the bottom mm. just where it's a nine it's obviously an hd signal and so the i have a, I, yeah i have a slightly different system to yours but a similar um similar ish setup it's basically sending a wireless signal um that that can be picked up by because the thing obviously with using your ipad in capture as capture pilot you need a you need a wi-fi network for that to work Mm -hmm. so this allows us to shoot with it in the field and send a signal without having to have a wi-fi network Mm -hmm. so it's yeah it's good it's good system yeah it's amazing really like how much technology keeps kind of changing our job and you know it's that thing of um i do sometimes wish i was in a career where the tech didn't change as quickly and you could just kind of get on with it. But I, I guess there aren't that many careers that are like that anymore where, you know, you um you can kind of get by without having to really update your knowledge. But I mean, that said, that You could said, have gone and been an accountant. <laughs> Num- <laughs> no, numbers, don't, it, numbers don't change. No, but the software does, doesn't it? Now you've got, you know, QuickBooks and Xero and uh, all Sage. of those kind of things. Yeah, people mm. like that, exactly. So, um but you did ruin my segue slightly there. Um, with Sorry. <laughs> so it's fine. It's fine. We'll pretend it didn't happen. Um, I was going to say really smoothly. I was going to say to some people, you know, technology moving on doesn't really affect their practice that much. In fact, today's guest we have. Oh, oh. <laughs> Mate, oh, very. I mean, come on. Yeah. It, it very, would have been smooth. Very good. Very good. <laughs> so. Yeah, on, to, on today's episode, we do actually have a fantastic interview with um, Jim Marsden, who is a film photographer uh, of some renown, who is based in the north. Um, uh, he's an absolutely lovely chap. Um, you know, full disclosure, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've known him for a, for a number of years. Um, he, the reason we wanted to get him on is, is Jim shoots um, a lot of, well, apart from the fact he's just a really nice guy and um, deserves you know, some attention. Um, Jim shoots uh, pretty much exclusively on film for his clients. And he doesn't do that in some kind of pretentious way. I think he just enjoys working in that medium. And, it, you know, when you hear the interview, you'll understand, like, he's got an infectious level of enthusiasm. Um, he, 
uh, yeah, continues that practice, basically shooting film. And um, I, I thought it was interesting uh, in this day and age to be able to do that commercially. And so that's basically what we talk about with Jim. Um, I think it's a great episode. So we hope that you will uh, listen and enjoy it. This week, we are delighted to uh, bring onto the show um, a good friend of mine and um, somebody who I think deserves a, um, a round of applause. No, actually, I mean, don't worry about that. We'll just, <laughs> we can't hear you. Um, this week, we are speaking to uh, Jim Marsden. Jim is um, a Lancashire born and bred and proud of it photographer, uh, born in the Rossendale Valley, I believe. Is that, is that right? Yeah, Jim? that's right, Greg. Explain to me where that is on the on the map. Where is it in a map? It's pretty terrible. It's probably like if you you get to Manchester and drive half an hour, pretty much directly north, you'll come to a town called Rottenstall, which is in the Rosendale Valley. So that yeah, that's yeah. where I go. Now, Jim, you predominantly are a film shooter, film photographer. Um, we met many moons ago, probably to chat wide luck stuff, probably, um, yeah. but. That is one of your many cameras. What um, you, you you shoot on film, and obviously that's a conscious choice that you've made. You work commercially on film for yep. clients. Yeah. Um, just talk us through a little bit of like the cameras that you use and and why. Like what, what are, what's your current kind of loadout? Uh, yeah, I suppose it's changed quite a bit over the years, but the kit that I use now is a mix of. Um, a bit of medium format, I use a couple of uh, Mamiya Universals. Um, they're a bit bulky and a bit big, but I really like them. And um, that's medium format, I use a Leica M2. Um, that's, yeah. Which is I, a 35mm rangefinder. That's a 35mm range rangefinder. Just... What year is that, though? Is that like... yeah, I was going to say, that's going to be 40s? No, it's like mid, right? it's like mid to late 60s, that I think. I'm oh, almost I'm, sure I'm it well is. out. Um, but I love that. Um, and then now the M the M two is no electronics, no nothing. no uh, no no meter, nothing at all. Nothing at all. Um, Not even a selenium meter, just nothing. literally nothing. Absolutely nothing. Lovely. Um, but the viewfinder is incredible. It's just like mm-hmm. super clean. I don't have a range of lenses for it. It's just one thirty five mm focal length that's stuck on it, never comes off. Um, mm-hmm. Not, it's not literally stuck on it. Not, <laughs> not literally. <laughs> but yeah, I never unscrew it. <laughs> um, Just in case you ever buy a camera off, Jim. This is it. It won't be super <laughs> bad. Definitely not. And, uh, and then the rest of the 35mm stuff, I have three Nikon Fs, original Nikons. Oh, lovely. Just because they just keep going and they don't need much fiddling with and they don't break down. Well, they never have touch wood. Um... And yeah, I suppose I use them for commercial work as well. So it's a toss up really between all three of those as to what sort of job I've got on. And that yeah. really determines the kind of kit that I bring with me. Um, and I mean, apart from looking lovely, what's, what, kind of, what are the benefits that you find to shooting um, with those cameras? Like, obviously you've made a conscious decision. It's, you've, it's a lot more effort involved in terms of... Um, developing film and uh, getting it scanned and and all of that but we'll get into that later what yeah. what is it about kind of shooting on film cameras that you love like what do you think it is that they bring to the party that's so special um i don't yeah people ask this and i don't think it's like a night and day thing you know i if somebody said oh is it better than digital i'd say no it's it's not i'd just say they both Look slight. It's just, there's just slight differences, and I suppose it's not mm-hmm. just the images that you're using them for. It's sort of, for me, it's like the feel of them and the sound of them and the speed of mm. them. And I suppose mm-hmm. crucial, the crucial thing for me using film cameras is not being able to see what I'm shooting and having no screen, because yeah. that really trips me up. I know for a lot, a long while ago. I tried shooting digital, but I get really frustrated with it. I suppose it's a sort mm-hmm. of, it's a sort of choice paralysis. There's too much. Mm. I can get too caught up in trying to oh, take that from a little bit of a different angle, take that again just like that. It's like, I'd rather just commit and go, no, just do it. Don't. That's the, that's the shot. That's it. You know, and mm. take two or three. Right, I've got it in there. Yeah. 
and just I'd rather it, it just feels more comfortable to it like that and mm. I find I suppose from the client side I suppose when I start with a new client and they figure that I'm shooting a film they're a little bit antsy because <laughs> they can't see an image <laughs> you know and I'm like just yeah yeah but I think all the clients that I work with now and I've worked with for a long time from their side the benefit is that they're not being forced to have to look at the back of a screen that mm-hmm. they can just ride along and we can chat do, more and there's more do you of a find, floor, do you find you know? a lot of clients sorry to talk over you do, right. do you find a lot of clients um of your repeat clients just go right we'll send jim out we don't need to be there there's a, there's not really much we we can offer because there's no instant feedback we trust jim um, off he goes some do yeah some do but I actually really like the client being there mm-hmm. purely to talk with you know and yeah. to sort of articulate what we're getting and what we can try because mm-hmm. I actually really like the client being involved on shoots mm-hmm. and mm. seeing them excited even though they can't necessarily see the screen I think there's a lot to be gained with client there and chatting well of course and, you know, the other thing is that the the paralysis you talk about with choice is kind of a common issue and we've all had it on on set where it's not only the photographer that's going to have that choice paralysis it's also potentially yeah. going to be the client yeah exactly so they can end up second guessing themselves as much as a photographer can when they start mm-hmm. seeing the work come through in a tethered form yeah and then it's a case of like oh actually let's just let's do this as well and let's try this and let's try this and and sometimes it can almost wear the idea down to the point where it becomes something just does has lost the initial kind of magic you know mm. yeah so well, i think that, de- that that definitely happens i i once had a shoot where um someone someone made a suggestion and then we discussed the the choice of tie for i think probably 45 minutes yeah and it's it's kind of at, at that point you know it was a blue tie or a red tie <laughs> and i was explaining to them that the blue tie could become red and the red tie could become blue yeah. so actually that that's a much quicker conversation to have after the shoot and then you um, remember that you're shooting in black and white anyway yeah exactly i was on triax <laughs> so no, no one might, no one really minded <laughs> yeah and that's so it, I mean, that's it so do you um do you develop your own stuff do you develop at home do you have a dark room at home no i have nothing at home i made a decision that, okay yeah i mean I suppose for clients, I wanted them to know it was going, it, it wasn't me doing it in my bloody sink, you know, and it was yeah. going to a lab. Um, yeah. And some of the jobs, you know, I might come back, there might be 50 or 60 rolls of film. I'll be at it forever. So no, it just yeah. goes, I'd just go and drop it straight over the lab. And I've worked with the same lab for 15 years, more. Mm-hmm. Wow. So they know. So they really know yeah. what you're after and what, Gym style is yeah. Which 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 lab is it? Are you happy to say? Yeah, of course. I've used uh, Peak Imaging in Sheffield. For, no, for all that I time. use Peak Imaging. I've yeah. yeah, brilliant. I know the guys. They're great. There. So you... I go in and see them. We have a crack, you know, and they're just they're just really nice to work with. And I've never had any complaints about what I get back. So I'm like, well, why should I? You know, they're an hour and a half drives mm. away from me. And why would I? Yeah, I've no reason to try anybody else. You know. No, fair okay. enough. Fair there enough. And go. also, yeah. you know, the the quality of them is fantastic. Yeah, definitely. yeah. I mean, I know photographers because they do post. They do postal, don't they? So I know yeah. photographers in London who use them and, and send stuff up to them. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah, they've actually. I've you know, I've, I've messaged you just before we did this recording. Obviously, I just picked up my first ever proper Hasselblad, um, and they, they are literally. I'm staring at negatives right here. Brilliant. Do I need to? I need to scan and and get through them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is daunting, right? I mean, that's a, that's the horrible thing about film photography is there's a, there's quite a lot of extra stuff. There's an extra admin, you know. When, when you shoot digital, pop the card in. Oh, great, everything's fine. Whereas now, for me, just to sit down and get these scanned in is going to take half a day. But then you become quicker at that, and certain labs will do that for you. I mean, I've heard the opposite argument in the sense that in a way like once you've dropped the film at the lab and the lab then gives hands of scans back there's almost less yeah less kind of involvement from the photographer like crucially less decisions to be made yeah see mm-hmm. i don't get that definitely that side it's like i find film photography simpler than digital right because i suppose i'll shoot a job 
I will take all that film to the lab. They'll process it. They'll scan it. I get an email with all the digital files in. Um, mm-hmm. And then it's a case of, I don't touch the digital files. It's just a case of putting them in some sort of order, kill the bloopers, and send them on to the client. So there's right. far less time of me sitting in front of a computer, way less. You know, typically, mm-hmm. it'd be a couple of hours, and that's it. Mm. Done. Well, have you got somewhere where you um, source your your film? Because I've noticed recently that um, Kodak, if, uh, you know, the portrait price of portrait has gone up, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I do. Do you have a favourite stock that you use and a place that you kind of? Yeah, I mean, up to before Fuji stopped doing theirs, you know, I was a massive Fuji fan, and I didn't really want to use mm-hmm. the Kodak stuff. But then Kodak became. The only one, really. You know, it was like Kodak and now, and they have got a big range of the stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, recently it's become a bit of a problem in that I think from talking to the, the guys that I buy film from, I don't buy it online, I buy it from, there's a shop 20 minutes away from me, um, mm-hmm. and it's cheap and it's good. And he's saying, you know, Kodak, are, they're sort of prioritising some of the lower-grade stuff, like the cheaper 35 mil stuff. Um, I, I saw this because they're because shifting students. tons of it and they're able to mark it up a lot um, yeah. I don't understand it but it does bugger me up a bit so I end up just trying <laughs> to stock up so I found and I've got to keep it a little bit quiet but a fairly inexpensive stock of Fuji medium format um, so I picked up 15 boxes yesterday so I've got 75 rolls to go at and I've got another 20 boxes coming in so I'm trying to just get them in <laughs> and just hide them away because I know I'll need them and I'll get through them uh, because Kodak, there was nothing in the fridge. No delivery. Where do you, right. st- where do you store all the, your film? Do you well, kind of a- yeah, the, my wife goes mad because the veg has to go out the fridge because I'm like, well, if something's got to be sacrificed, <laughs> you can ditch all that veg. <laughs> Film's got to go in the fridge. <laughs> but um, I mean, a lot of it, to be honest, I don't even need to refrigerate. It just gets used so quick. You know, it's just mm-hmm. stored in my room and it's dark and, you know, there's no crazy fluctuation in temperature. So it just gets used up. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I go to um, a shop in Bolton uh, for all my film. Again, because I like seeing the guys behind the counter, you know, and having a mm-hmm. chat and they can get me in pretty much everything I want, apart from Kodak at the minute. <laughs> Do you feel like there's any, I mean, obviously within, in terms of like Polaroid, um, I know you used to shoot a bit of Polaroid when, when it was available. Definitely. Um, do you think, oh, I mean, there's companies, there was the Impossible Project mm. that started and then that seemingly got bought by Polaroid, which is funny really, because they obviously then, they they kind of, I mean, I have to be careful what I say in case they're saying anything defamatory, but didn't they kind of, <laughs> Didn't they close down and then lost all of the, or a lot of the stuff, the chemicals and the recipes and everything were kind of lost with it. And then Impossible Project kind of started experimenting and finding a way to make it happen. And now Polaroid in a totally different guise has kind of bought that back up and started doing it again. Oh, have they? And yet it's like, I think so. I think I thought, but maybe I'm wrong. There's another, there's another company called, um, is it Super Sense in, right. in Vienna? I feel like they might be the same people and they've been inventing, trying to bring back um, pack film. Right, oh, please, but, yeah, that would be but, incredible. But Well, at the moment, I think what they have is a single pack film. So you can buy a single shot and it costs about 20 quid. Oh, my God. So oh, it's yeah, more it's expensive than shooting 5-4 film <laughs> or 10 by 8 film, yeah. Um yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's interesting. I often wonder with the way that tech is going, and there's long been rumoured kind of, I saw the other day that there was some kind of adapter that you could stick on the back of a film camera and, sh- and shoot using your iPhone as a sensor. Oh. But like, go through the lens or whatever. And I do what, and I remember years ago as well, there was, a, there was an April Fool's about a company that had developed a digital sensor that basically sat in a film canister and you could, on a flexible <laughs> piece of material. Yeah, and that got people hugely excited until they realised it was a load of yeah, BS. a lot of gum. Um, yeah. 
But I do wonder if at some point in the future that does happen and all of these film cameras that have been sat on a shelf can actually be kind of bought out for retirement in a way. Yeah, I mean, I'd hate to see all these film cameras go because it's not just, you know, it's not just cameras, it's incredible lenses as well, you know, that I've had. Yeah. And I feel like at some point in the future, yeah, if film does die, maybe they'll come out with a system like the Mimirad, like the leaf back, you know, like the digital Mm -hmm. back that can fit onto a film camera. Maybe there's some sort of a... I don't know why nobody's... Maybe there is. I don't know. I've just never looked into it. But like a... Not a universal sensor mm. back, but something that could mm. be put onto plates, onto various cameras, especially medium format. Um, it feels mm. like it... I don't know. It feels like something could be done, but I suppose there's a lot of expense and a lot of experimentation to get to the point, uh, you know? And it is kind of like killing half the point of shooting on film in the first place, totally. I guess, isn't it? <laughs> this is it. Especially... I guess the... the the purists kind of, you know, they won't be into that. No, no. But the appetite, but the appetite is there. Look at the is the, the Yashica. Uh, they they bought out. They raised a Kickstarter. They raised a huge amount of money on a Kickstarter, um, where they bought out a digital camera that shot on the on the presets of film with I think little cartridges that you slotted into the camera. Am I right? I think I'm right. Oh right. And yeah, they, I remember seeing something about this. And the, and then the camera came out and it. It didn't quite live up to the hype. I think is the nicest way of putting that. Yeah. And um, but but the appetite is clearly there. Yeah. For all of this stuff, for the aesthetic, for the way of shooting, for the look, for the feel. Yeah. Well, it's um, interesting in the sense that, like F- Fujifilm, for example, on their cameras, they have these these in camera grades, mm. Mm. these looks that you put on, and it can write it onto the JPEG or, um, you know, so that you could spit that JPEG out of camera with their color science yes. embedded on your image and a lot of people have argued that actually the processor inside the camera mixed with their camera uh, their color science is better than what it would you'd get if you put it through capture one or lightroom and try to um use a kind of version of that same preset um but it's interesting because i'm amazed that more camera brands aren't doing that mm. and kind of saying well actually we want to try and create something that you will only get if you use this uh, brand of camera, yeah, def- this yeah. particular look. Yeah, definitely. It does feel, um, though, that over over the years, the race has been on with... I, I, I kind of feel that maybe that is happening a little bit, but more so on the cinema side. So, for example, years and years and years, or four years and years and years, uh, the companies have been trying to create perfectly len- perfect lenses. You know, they're technically beautifully sharp, no color cast, no fringing, no flare, no nothing, no character, effectively, yeah. uh, which obviously we don't have with the old lenses. But uh, Sigma, for example, bought out a, uh, a cinema set of their prime lenses, which were very good, but very uh, technically good. I always think that Zeiss lenses now, modern Zeiss lenses are a great standard of very, very technically brilliant lenses, but no real artistic vibe. I mean, at least that's my my experience of them. But Sigma bought out the art, not the art series, they bought out, I can't remember what it was called. They bought out a softer one with less coatings, so more flair, more look, more of a vintage aesthetic, more of a softer vibe. And so I do feel that people are, companies are kind of cottoning on that people are after especially things you know in cinema the cook look you know people love that sort of vibe mm-hmm. um and you know we're all we're all doing it with diffusion filters and and all sorts of Mists. stuff and I, yeah mists and i i hope that um the companies are starting to kind of pay attention really and mm. give us a little bit more character back yeah. out of your out of your collection jim what's your kind of i mean that's the thing when you're talking about earlier you touched on this with the older lenses and them having car- you know certain looks mm. and um have you got any particular favorites um on the mamiya universal i have um a hundred mil 2.8 mm-hmm. and i adore it i think the closest okay. thing i can get to it when i used to shoot pentax six sevens mm. it was like a 105 2.4 that I I used to laugh every time the images come back because it, 
it is glorious, absolutely beautiful. Mm. And this is similar. But that one's that one's really well known for like the super su- like buttery background and totally. And this yeah. one's sort of similar, but even sharper. It's like it's right. a ridiculous thing. And I suppose it's not the sharpness that I'm after. It's just as you say, it's a certain quality to it. I don't need it to be perfect. I just mm. need it to look a particular way. I need the mm-hmm. outer focus to feel a particular way and the sharp bits to feel a certain way. And that lens, I. Pff, yeah, I absolutely adore it. And uh, well, the Mamiya uh, Universal is that similar to the um, Polar- Polaroid six hundred SE? Is it similar body? Very isn't much. It? Yeah, they look. I've seen identical from the Don outside. Don McCullen use it, I think, yeah, for landscapes. Definitely, and it's a bit clunky. They're beasts. They're massive. It's beast, and it's yeah. just a big rangefinder um, with a big trigger handle. But I suppose I bought yeah. it because it was so simple. Because there's nothing inside the camera box. There's a little lever that moves the rangefinder. That's an rangefinder. Because it's a leaf. Sh- it's a shutters in the in the lens. Lens, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I got it just because, just for. It ain't gonna break. <laughs> you know. I mean, the camera, the medium format that I used to shoot before this, and I wish I could get one back, but the money's got gone nuts. Is I used to shoot um, a Rolly Flex for a long time for all my medium format stuff. Mm. It was a Rolly with a prism on the top and mm-hmm. that just it felt like a medium format Leica sounded similar it felt similar it was compact and it was so quick um, mm. but they'd just got nuts it completely died I'd worn it out so I had mm. somebody buy it even busted for the same money as I bought it for eight years ago so it's like yeah pass well. it on get a different system and then I saw the Mamiya stuff and I thought well yeah, I like the lens. I, I like the fact you can change the back so I can do 645, 67, 69. Um, mm-hmm. And there's nothing to it. It's unbelievably simple. So it ain't going to break on me. Um, do you think... Right, so so you know I've just bought a Hasselblad. I actually just bought two Hasselblads because I got offered one at a really good price and I kind of had to. And also I butchered the prism off it, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> so I've... I've I've cannibalized the prism off that one onto my onto my pristine 1981 Got you. Uh, one. Now you're, I'm sure you're the same as me, right? I bought it. It's so beautiful, but I really don't want to be that guy to keep it in the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want I want to take it out. I really want to shoot with it. You know, it is. It's had now seven rolls of film through it, and it's an entire life. And I've put five of them through. Yeah. You know, it's you don't get cameras like Quite that now. Not. So for me, it's it's really special, right? Yeah. So. But I, I paid a lot of money for it. You know, mm. we're, we're talking thousands. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the cost of film, for example, you know, the cost of film is really expensive. The cost of processing, actually, you know, go to peak imaging, I think actually it's very reasonable yeah. for, for the processing side of things. But the then when it comes back, I'm going to be doing my own scanning, which I've just spent £600 on a film scanning set up with a, you know, Actually, it's quite nice. I'll show you it to you in a minute. It's called a Veloy 360 from Finland. It's actually surprisingly good. Really? Um, but just the, the the cost of everything at the moment mm. seems to have just rocketed. Yeah. Which is does. funny because I would have just assumed the price of film would have gone up, which would have discouraged people. Mm. But now, you know, you're paying thousands upon thousands now for a really good quality one of these and i understand about demand and supply and the scarcity of these things and and things yeah. but it does seem quite prohibitive I, i'm i'm very lucky that i'm a few years into my career right and i i've i've been very lucky to work with the people that i've worked with but for people who are starting out the idea of them getting a hasselblad is probably quite probably quite un, unattainable Mm. You know, just if they can afford the the camera, you know, when I was first starting out, I didn't have two thousand pounds to buy a Hasselblad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then if I if I did have two thousand pounds to buy a Hasselblad, I definitely didn't have the money to buy the scanning setup and the film processing and the and the film costs, let alone everything else. Yeah. To then learn on. So I know people will in, inherit them as their grandparents pass. Seemingly mainly likers down to people. Yeah. It seems to be everyone around me was like, "Oh yeah, I've got a liker." I was like, "Oh, where'd you get it from, Grandfa- grand- grandfather?" Yeah, thanks, Grandad. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> but the um, it it does seem I would love for Yashika or something to come out with 
a four hundred pound TLR mm. or so or something like that. Something that'd be really attainable for people who just want to dip their toe in to the world of film or you know, they want to it a bit, it's a bit plasticky for me, Greg. <laughs> I used to love mine. Oh, uh, I mean, they're really interesting little cameras in terms of trying to, uh, if you want a distinctive look. Yeah, with the holders. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. But you know, you and know the, what I mean, the, like the clever little tricks. I mean, there's a photographer, um, photojournalist. Uh, oh God, I'm going to get his name wrong, so I'm not going <laughs> to say it. But I, I, I think it was da- is it Damon Winters. I can't remember, but he shot stuff in Iraq and Afghanistan on his Holger, or maybe it was just Iraq, but it was using multiple exposures where he would, there was a technique that you could do with it where you would roll, you would wind it on a certain amount of clicks. Mm. And because there was no actual um, physical winding knob in the sense that it would just wind it on one shot, you could overlap all your shots. So if you wanted to, you could actually film up an entire, fill up an entire 120 roll of film with one continuous shot that's a great idea like a Chinese overlap. scroll that's a fantastic idea yeah that's superb idea. so they're really good for shooting panoramics yeah. but you get this slight double exposure and you have to know how many clicks to move it on mm. um, but there's a lot of fun and you Definitely. get some incredibly creative um, results from it and I guess that's to go back to what you were saying earlier that's another part of in a way, sometimes the accidents yeah. that come back from the lab Definitely. are mm. things that you would just have discounted before. But because there's a scarcity of choice, because you've only got three frames, it's almost like it's almost like with film photography, you you kind of get the the respect for the the frozen moment in time more that you don't when you're shooting, you know, twenty five frames a second in digital. Yeah, definitely. Because the idea. Yeah. The, the whole concept of the decisive moment is so much more magical in film because of the scarcity of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I think with film, it's definitely, you know, the constraints of what make you think differently and mm-hmm. that can, yeah, as you say, it can lead to you thinking differently when you're shooting. I think that's the biggest thing, you know, it's, yeah. There's also, do you think it kind of, it yeah, so it's a bit like people have said in the past you know and it's the problem with editorial jobs for example um picking a, like a, a portrait assignment quite often we'll go along and i'll take a whole mix of different lighting because i just don't know what i'm going to come you know the face to face with in yeah, terms of like the situation yeah, yeah, yeah. and sometimes if especially if it's you know somebody in the entertainment industry the, the, there might be last minute changes they might be late to the they might be they suddenly decide oh well, they they don't they no longer want to do this whatever so you have to be truly adaptable yeah however there's something to be said for actually less is more and going to those things and 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 actually uh, restricting yourself with your kit and saying you know what i'm only going to take one lens i'm only going to take one uh, form of lighting yeah whatever because it forces you to then shoot in a certain way and i do sometimes wonder that if you've got loads of kit loads of stuff it it becomes almost harder to develop a look mm. because every time you go on a job you can do it in a totally different way yeah whereas when you look at your work for example there's a real consistency to it because most of it will have been shot on a 35 or a 50 mil or maybe an 85 yeah you know, like th- th- there's a kind of like there's there's three basically fields of view that most of it's going to be. Um, it's either going to be a certain type of color or it's going to be black and white. It, and and then the work starts to get this beautiful consistency and this kind of feeling of just it just runs throughout all of it and connects it all together, which I feel mm. then c- completes a bigger picture of who you are as a person. Yeah, and I feel having sort of less the less thinking that I have to do when I get there I mean if it was like a portrait job I'd have one camera in the bag with one lens on it and that's it and just some film Mm. and it allows me I don't need to think about the camera or the kit at all but it allows me to engage with the sitter in a different way because that's part Mm. of the bit that I I like the chat (laughs) so it means that I can engage and talk Mm. and have a good laugh while not stressing at all about the kit, because I know I, what that's going to do. I know what I can get out of that with the sitting that we've got. 
So I suppose mm. that's one of the big things for me, is not having to faff. It means that I can go there and just be with the person um, and mm-hmm. not really think about the gear. See, for me, though, oh, t- the idea of turning up to a job with one camera and one lens <laughs> uh, g- gives me sweats. I tell you, on- honestly, like full on, I'm drenched in sweat here. I mean, now people can now see me, so obviously I'm not. But, it, you know, what happens if that camera goes down? I always bring double, I suppose, is the answer. Oh, oh yeah, okay. I say one okay. camera, but that's why there's two one style memories. of camera there's 235 there's always a backup so if one dies I know I've got another one there sure um, okay fine fine but yeah. good I mean I, I don't I want to mention at this point you you recently um, produced a book uh, was it the next turn may reveal heaven yes. is that right yeah that's right yeah um, if is, is that still for sale have been people get copies of that um, find copies online yeah I, d- I didn't think that many people would buy it to be honest it was it was a collection of images I've been shooting for about five years um, <laughs> well I, I, the reason I put it up is I, I loved the title because I felt like it it sums up your approach to stuff in the sense that the next turn may reveal heaven is this idea that you're open to those things just presenting themselves which to go back to what you yeah. were worrying about with that approach Tom of like one camera mm. I think it's a mindset isn't it it's a mindset of a certain level of like it will be um, it'll all be okay totally the Marsden Zen oh listen I, I suppose I've always if I turn up to a shoot I'm, I'm like I always stand in front of me uh, kit if that makes sense it's like I try and engage mm. with them before they even see kit mm-hmm. and then the actual taking of a photograph secondary that's like the smallest yes. bit and I'll get mm, the yeah. kit out of the bag when it feels right. But I feel like on any job, the main part of my job is to engage with the people there. And then the small mm, bits of mm. the photography. Because if I can engage and we can get on the same level, when the photographs are just going to be there, I don't even need to worry about them. They're going to be there mm. because of the relationship mm. that we've got in that small amount of time. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with that, Greg. I definitely rock up and go in. Whatever you've got, <laughs> I'm not really worried about it. It's just it'll it'll all be fine. It'll all be good. Um, but the the books actually um, is a series of photos of, of like the general kind of travelling shots, aren't they? From car windows and what have you. Yeah. Um, there's a beautiful kind of sense of uh, just. I don't know, it's just a certain mood to the images that really makes me almost feel kind of homesick. Yeah, it's funny, somebody <laughs> else said that as well, and I'm like, I never thought that in it. I know I had no sort of preconceptions when I was putting it together. I think the main reason I put it together was I want to start making more books like that. So mm-hmm. I needed to practice. So it was completely self... I, I have a reprographics place in town, and I said, look, if you just print the images you know, 12 on a good sheet of paper. I'll do all the cutting. I'll cut all the covers. I'll do all the binding. I'll get a print. I'll do it all just as a, a thing to play with of these images I've been taking for five years. Um, and it was basically, yeah, it was me trying to learn how to put books together. And as a starting mm. point, I've never done it before. And um, it was really good to think about it. And, you know, the sequence of these things mm. that are not even connected there, but they're five years worth of this similar thing. And just to figure out why I take them, you know, because I, I never took them with any real purpose. But then as soon as you start putting them mm. all together, you're like, oh, okay. Well, they do attach in a little way, and yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was a really interesting process actually. Well, so a, you a, you handmade the book? Yeah, totally. I had to in in the end. I thought, well, I'll sell a dozen. You know, um, how many? How many? Well, no, I mean, how many did you end up making? Well, the kitchen had to turn into like a production. <laughs> Uh, office <laughs> and I had to take up all the work so I ended up selling 50 in the end um, brilliant and I could only make two a day that's how long it took to mm-hmm. cut each single page out punch all the holes cut the covers wow. stamp sew them together so it did take me a while yeah but it was it was a good yeah it was a good thing to learn actually and I'm yeah working on doing well more. also those those 50 people have ended up with you know a really beautiful handmade you know, blood, sweat, and tears into it. Well, mm. yeah, I'd hope so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think um, <laughs> they seemed to like it, which was yeah, which was great. 
Well, it also right. fits in with your 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 approach to photography in that sense of keeping it natural and, and, and for want of a better word, kind of organic in that sense. Yeah. Mm. And a lot of your, um, you know, we've discussed this a lot in the past, but, you know, a lot of your, where based on where you live, um, being kind of up near the lakes and what have you, a lot of your mindset with photography has come from spending time in landscapes, isn't it, as well, Definitely. and kind of walking. Yeah. Um, if, if people want to check out, there's a, he's going to blush now, but there's a lovely video of Jim on his website that he did, because not many people know this, but Jim has his own camera bag, uh, the Marsden bag. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, <laughs> one of I used to. Yeah, I still do work for. There was a, a, a bag company in the Lay District called Millican, and I used to do a lot of work for them. And then after a period of time, the creative director came to me and said, "Look, Jim, we want to do it. all the bags are named after people, and they might be people in the Lay District. There's a story behind it." So he came to me and said, "Look, we want to do a Marsden rucksack." So I laughed my head off, and I'm, but I'm like, yeah, man, if you, <laughs> if you want to do it, yeah, that sounds great. Um, so they did it, but then they used to do quite a lot of little films along with the release of each bag. So they made this little film of me just like a, I suppose, a day in the life, just me at home faffing, mm. you know, with cameras and <laughs> kiddos there and dog. Pretty simple, really. But um, yeah, yeah, it was it was lovely, and I love working with them guys. So it was, um, it, although it was embarrassing. Is, is it was there lovely. any? <laughs> You're too modest. Was the um, what's, is there anything special about the bag that you know that you managed to have put in? Is there like um, you know a, a, a little flap for your tea flask or anything that's unique to you and your approach? No, there wasn't really. I wish, yeah, I wasn't really involved in the design process. Uh, there was like two bags. <laughs> there was like a side bag. And there was like a rucksack, yeah. and I'm like, dude, it looks looks great. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I. So I I, I got uh, I got sent a couple, and I still use them. They're great, but um, yeah, yeah, it was nothing specific to me, but I was very happy to right, endorse okay. them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and you got the lovely film out of it. Yes, I was saying I was saying to Jim, I was saying to Jim off air. It, it's a very honest, lovely. You know, you get I got a real feel for who you were as a person just by watching that. And so, you know, you very much live up to the expectations created by the film. Oh, I'm glad. Well, thank so. you. Yeah. It's what's, have you got, um, I mean, obviously we've, we've just come through, um, what was it we've done? Uh, a pandemic. Corona. Oh yeah, that. <laughs> um, are you excited about kind of moving beyond that now? Have you got any um, exciting plans for... 2022, 2023. Yeah, definitely. I suppose it, it. I know that you were doing some stuff with uh, some kind of teaching, weren't you? Workshops. Yeah. Um. Last year was the busiest year I've ever had, which was really weird. Um, wow. But the year before it, obviously, we all got. Yeah, I got well hammered. Uh, everything dropped. Mm. Yeah. Um. But I've got, yeah. I, you know, I've got a 14 year old son, so I just put all cameras away. And went right. I'm homeschooling. So and it was lovely just to be able to take a pause. It was nice. But then it all came yeah. back with a rush last year, like real rush. Um, some clients dropped away because some clients, I think it just took them too long. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And it'll either take them a long time to come back or they'll be, yeah, unfortunately be gone. But a lot of new clients came in and that was a case mm -hmm. of that was a return on, you know, emails sent two years ago saying, do you fancy a cup mm. of tea, you know? And then some brand new clients that I'd never expected. Um so yeah, this year, yeah, a really mixed bag of work. I'm, yeah, I'm really excited about getting into it all. It starts sort of waking up from now for me. I don't know about you two, but January is usually mm -hmm. still slumber, really slow. But from February onwards, it starts, yeah, yeah, definitely picking up. And yeah. are you doing any workshops uh, coming up at all? Um, or any I sort of, I skipped the or... workshops, as because well, I was doing workshops for Lycra as well in London. Yes, mm -hmm. but then Lycra Academy was it? Yeah, that's right. Um, but then when the pandemic is that with Robin? It was with Robin. Yeah, he's lovely as Robin, isn't he? Shout, shout out to Robin, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I sort of struggled with. Um, it was really cut. It was really nice. He approached me during the pandemic to see if I'd do some online stuff. Um, but I'll be really honest. I really struggle with online workshops because I feel like it's mm. just me just broadcasting, presenting. Yeah, whereas yeah. I'd rather be in a room with a lot of people and 
do it slightly differently. So they're doing a lot of the mm-hmm. talking and there's more of a conversation rather than me just broadcasting at them. Um, I'd love mm-hmm. to do them again. It might not be this year, but um, yeah, I might look towards the end of this year and see if there might be something I can do again. Mm-hmm. Do you take your trusty M2 along on those uh, workshops then? Is that what you're... Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We I, I, we didn't touch actually what was the 35 that you've got on there just from a total nerdy point of view. What, what is it? No, yeah. I mean, you come back to this, um, you were speaking about it before, about... Um, or you hinted at it, you know, not having a perfect look, you know, to cameras <laughs> yeah. and lenses. So mm. rather than have a, a like a lens on that, it's a Voigtlander lens. And it's been the same Voigtlander lens on there since I got it years ago. Um, and it's a mm-hmm. 35 1.2. Um, oh, the Noct- the Nocton. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I've never had, and it's, yeah, it's not a like a lens, <laughs> but it's got its own look. And I adore it. Mm-hmm. I'll never change that. Mm. It's yeah. So that's what's on there. It's a Voigtlander thirty-five one point two. Also, they're they're pretty good build quality, aren't they? Yeah. yeah that thirty-five one two. I actually owned one at one point. It's a pretty hefty. Yeah. It's a pretty hefty thing. Right? Definitely, definitely. And um, I've shot mm. thousands of rolls through that, and it's still as tight. Everything still works in exactly the same way, and it's never, you know, nothing's unscrewed, nothing's dropped off. It's it's still really good mm-hmm. build quality. Is that Voigtlander? I think uh, Voigtlander, if people are interested, I'm fairly certain they're distributed by Flaghead. Right. Um, and you can buy the Voigtlander lenses through Robert White. Right, got you. Bizarrely. But yes, uh, I only really know that. It's guy I used to deal with a guy called Hardy at uh, Flaghead, and a very nice chap. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the lenses are fantastic. Yeah. Really and they've, they've, got, they've got all sorts of 35s, haven't they? They've got a 1.4 as well. Yeah, I think they have it's a uh, lot which is smaller SM, than 1.4, isn't it? SMC, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a bit more of a standard size. Yeah. But the um, the Noctons are good. Yeah, really like it. Mm. Do you get any snobbery you- from people who are like, oh, can't believe you're using that on that? Uh, some ask the question, but I'm like, yeah. I'm not bothered, man. If I, if I can get the images that I like the look of out of it, I don't matter what goes on the front of it, you know? So um, Yeah, of course. And it just, yeah, all the rolls. And I only shoot black and white through that M2. Um, okay. So everything, I've never had reason. Everything I get back, I, I really like the look of it. Mind me asking why it's just black and white through that one? It's that choice paralysis thing again. I sort of... Sure. If, if I didn't, it'd just be another 35 millimeter that's in the same bag with the Nikons. And then mm-hmm. I'd have to think, oh, do I take the Leica? So that Nick, that Leica has only ever shot landscape, black and... Well, yeah, landscape orientation, black and white images. Um so I have a couple of jobs a year where that's all they want me to shoot. So it's like mm. an event. And I might have to shoot like just documentary style stuff for like four days. Mm-hmm. So I just take 50 rolls of Tri-X and shoot the Leica day in, day out. And it's it's lovely. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's a question of that. I try and apportion certain kinds of things to all the cameras so that I'm not mm. fussing about which camera kit to take on what kind of job. They've all got the sort of role more or less. I wish I had your discipline. <laughs> I, just, I can't. My my camera bag has got four different four different lenses, three bodies, two lights, and then that's just before I start bringing out the heavy the heavy kit. Yeah. And I just I'm I'm same as Greg. We we get sent to stuff where we have to almost get three different setups that are completely different. Yeah. I, can I, I just don't have that discipline. Do you I'm very still, jealous. <laughs> do you still have your um your white? Oh, box? I wish I did, Greg. I'm still. Oh par- no, you've sold it. No, it died on me. I think. Um, I think oh. one of the pro. I don't know if it's a common problem with them wide luxes, because of the way that you wind on the turret for it to swing round to cock the lens and then start its travel. I think sometimes the gears can chip in the bottom, so when you wind yeah. they don't, and then it started getting banding as well. So I think the whole turret when it turns, start, and I'm like, you have to massage the lens. Yeah, you have to sort of keep pulling it back to make sure that it's. Yeah, and, um, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna try something for for radio. Brilliant. <laughs> Hang on two seconds. So <laughs> you can now see me. Oh God. Gre- Greg is gonna massage for everyone live. <laughs> <here. laughs> this I was not expecting. Not Greg. Greg. I was. I'm yeah. Sorry, goals. Jim. I'm really sorry. <laughs> there we go. Can you, can you hear this? There you go. 
that, is that coming over the mic? Yeah, yeah, it, it is, is coming over the mic. Definitely. Do you want to, you want to explain? Hashtag <laughs> ASMR now. I'm sure it is, yeah. This goes out. <laughs> yeah, so basically the Wide Lux is a 140 degree um, swing lens panoramic. Yeah. Uh, did you have the F7? No, I had the F8, I think. Did I? Is there an F8? Oh, okay. I think there is, isn't it? I'm not, I, can't, I can't remember which one I don't I know. Mine's an F7. Um, um, but I, sorry, I'm, I'm miles away from the mic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a great camera. Oh, I adore but, uh, it. They, 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 they're probably an absolute bugger to try and fix. Yeah, it's all just clockwork, isn't it? That was the problem that I got. And I thought, well, I'll shift it on, um, not thinking that the prices, like all film cameras, have just jumped up, so I can't easily go get yeah. another one. Um, yeah, but I like that camera so much, and the look on people's faces when they saw it, yeah, because it looks cool. But then as soon as that turret starts doing its yeah. circuit around it'd be interesting oh. actually if there's if there's any listeners who um we do want to speak to someone at some point who works in camera repairs mm. that would be quite interesting as a as a guest because i mean some of the stuff they must see but i know that there are little places that pop up and kind of funny you know nooks and crannies of there'll be one person who kind of operates out of their house who's the one person in the uk who probably knows how to fix a wide or something like that i'm sure there is someone out I'm there. sure there is well, there was a com- yeah. there was a company in liverpool who i i got a vintage lens years ago and they it was a like a odd russian thing and they were like i messaged them i was like oh you know can you guys fix this and they were like oh yeah of course we do it all the time i'm like what do you mean you do it all the time there aren't that many of these lenses in the world let alone yeah. In the UK, was that Newton Ellis, Tom? It was Newton Ellis, yeah. That's where I get my <laughs> kit serviced. Yeah, ah, oh, that's there we the go. tiny. You, you know, you said that then, Greg. Tiny little place with it. It's yeah, just yeah, yeah. You, you go there and it's on like a no, you know nondescript little street, tiny door, and you go in <laughs> and he's hunched over the counter and there's another guy in the back, tiny little yeah. shop, but they've serviced the roller, the Leica. And they have a, they've always done an incredible job. But they're like, I rang them because I needed something sorted. They can't, you know, it's like a six month waiting list at the minute. Like, there's yeah, so many, the they've so much work on of, of all these repair guys. Um, but this is what I'm saying. Feel, like, it's great the, for them. That's great. Oh, yeah. But the, the appetite is, is clearly the here. You know, there. everyone yeah, who's in. Yeah. The camera prices are through the roof. Yeah. The repair guys are booked up for uh, six months to a year. Yeah. You know, well, if you think about it for the lenses point of view, I mean, um, both myself and Tom kind of have noticed this through, you know, shooting moving image is obviously there is so much more interest in stills lenses yeah. from cinematographers and DOPs that mm. want to use them for a certain look. And the price of lenses has gone through the roof, like old lenses that 10 years ago, no one wanted anymore. And they would have been sent to a charity shop. And now people are, you know, uh, getting them and taking out the aperture and you know making it so it's fluid aperture or whatever. Uh, yeah. well, people are paying hundreds for FD sets and stuff. You know, if you want a yeah. Leica R set, mm. you know, I I got offered one. This is going to be like catastrophic. Like I got offered a Leica R set fifteen years ago for for nothing, mm. and I was like, ah, you know, there aren't really adapters. Yeah, you know, I can't really use them now. God, I wish I just bought them and stuck them in the loft. Oh, they're, mm. you know, they're they're super in demand. Really interesting, isn't I mean, it? Great. It yeah. happens. That's why I hold on to a lot of my film cameras, mm. even if I'm not shooting them that regularly. Yeah. Is that part of me does believe that down the line they're only becoming more and more scarce, and at least I'm keeping them kind of in a, you know, a humidity controlled environment and what mm. have you. It, I do worry that some of them will just seize up from yeah. Oh, inaction. definitely. But, uh, yeah, I know. It's, hence me massaging yeah. Greg. <laughs> just keep massaging Greg. It'll, yeah, it's so uh, <laughs> I suppose I forgot to mention. It, it's almost like a stre- it's almost like a little stress release. <laughs> yeah. you know, in the it's background. a stress ball, yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> um, but yeah, you mentioned that about um, you know, keeping all the old yeah, film cameras. And I do have, I don't use it particularly much, an old Nikon 35mm. It looks like an F, but it was used for, mm. um, but it's a medical one. So it screws onto the back. What do you mean by of, that? Like, it screws onto the back of a microscope. It's a film camera. Oh, okay. And I've never seen them before, but I managed to get it for like 20 quid years ago. And it's really weird. And so there's no, the, sh- the, the shutter doesn't work in, there's no shutter. Um, well, how does it work now? Yeah, you can switch between full frame and half frame. Um, it's a Nikon MD something. Somebody will know about it. 
Um, but I turned it into MD, a, as in Doctor, as in do- Doctor, as in Nikon. Doctor Nikon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I made it into a, I converted it into a pinhole camera. So I got a oh wow a, a cat a body cap little hole in it. Mm. But I don't know what they're worth now. I've not dread to look actually. But yeah, I think I'm just trying mm. to keep as much as I can, especially since the prices seem to be definitely going daft. Yeah, P- pinhole cameras are something that are really a uh, nice little thing for people who are interested in film photography to play around with as well. Although you do need to kind of have access to the chemicals to develop and what have definitely. you. Definitely. But um, I've made some pin- some interesting pinhole cameras in my time and they are, you can you can just make them from pretty much anything. Anything, mm. can't you? Yeah, they're really interesting. Hmm. Well, I mean, we probably should wrap this up, Jim, but we, before we go, we, we always like to, um, well, first of all, I want to say, where can people find your work? You're, you're, you're on Instagram. We'll tag that okay. on the, yep. um, when the posts go out on your website. Um, but it's just Jim Marsden Photography on Instagram, if people want to find you. Um, we always have to ask our guests uh, Desert Island camera and their desert island book so the desert island camera to start with i think it's gonna be a tough one is it no the camera that i've obviously got the camera that i've wanted for so long is the uh fuji 617 so it's another panoramic Uh, but it's a monster i saw the work that mm. joseph cadelka made with that shooting holy land and i've all it's almost got its own roll cage right oh yeah it's got like an enormous (laughs) cage around the lens because it's so big um, wow, yeah. that thing's huge! It's enormous, but I, and it's medium format as well. And I saw that Cadelka work, and I was like, "Oh, I'm really drawn to this panoramic stuff." You know, not from a take the commercial head off for a minute, but for, for my own work, I love that panoramic mm-hmm. format because there's a lot to try and get in the right places in a frame, rather than a, a little yes. short frame. So yeah, it'd have to be a Fuji six one seven. And I mean, I say, I say uh-huh. they're quite expensive. They might be a grand and a half, two or something. That's the, I find that quite expensive still. But they're not as expensive mm. as some stuff, especially when you're having to pay bloody a thousand quid for like a Contax T3. <laughs> you know, in the grand scheme, it's like, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of kit for your money, really. But yeah, it'd have to be a 617. It's cheaper right. than a Linhoff studio as well. My, my local uh, camera sh- uh, store have got the Linhoff in. Right. And it's- stunningly made yeah. I mean beautiful but it's three grand and that's a, that's a lot of money it's a lot of money a it's lot all of money. money definitely is and and it doesn't come with its own roll cage well <laughs> so this is it <laughs> so the next thing Jim then is your desert island photo book what's that going to be um I was thinking about this and that is it's really difficult because there was a point where I was yeah, collecting a lot of books. But I suppose mm-hmm. the book, yeah, I suppose the Desert Island book is one that I've already got. And it was one that I got right near the beginning of when I started working with photography. And it is a Bruce Weber book uh, published by okay. Alfred Knopf in 1989. And it was, it was that book that when I got it, it was, it just changed the way I thought about the kind of images that I want to make. Mm-hmm. And just the power of them, the style of them. So it'd have to be that. And if not, it'd be Bruce Davidson's Brooklyn Plus, Gang. I, I'm not... Oh, yeah, great. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the, the, what's the Bruce Davidson book called? Uh, the Bruce Webber. The... Yeah, but what's the Bruce Davidson one uh, called? Brooklyn Gang. Brooklyn Gang, yes. Okay. And the Bruce Webber one is more... Because he was obviously more of a kind of fashion photographer. That's right. So that's a bit of a, for me, that I, that surprises me that you've picked that. But what's what was the content of the book? Um, it's just classic Bruce Weber. It was a sort of... Okay. What? I mean, he was a master of black and white. It's all black in, and white. In black and white fashion. It's all, it? Yeah, it's all black and white. Um, it's not particularly fashion. It's more just men and masculinity. But the style of the yeah. images... Ah. Uh, I'd still refer back to that stuff now because it was that it was that kind of image that got me really excited about making photographs because just the power of them the the just the way yeah. that the people within the photographs looked like they wanted to be there you know and they're engaged <clears throat> yes. in it and there was photographs there yeah. that weren't necessarily you know there was movement and blur and just joy and power and masculinity and yeah 
I still go back to it now. It's such a yeah. It still makes me excited about making photographs now, even though I don't particularly make photographs like that. But I think mm-hmm. yeah. it really, really inspired me at the time when I got it years ago. Well, it's amazing, isn't it, that you can have in your mind, you can have a photographer's work that you really love and a book that you really love. And at the same time, it will have a small impact on what you do, but it might not be aesthetically on what yeah. you do. It might just be on something that you aspire to or something that, about the way that you approach your work yeah, or something about definitely. the way you approach your subject. Yeah, definitely, definitely, um, definitely. I mean, it's not... I think for a while I was trying to emulate the style, but then I just let that mm. drop away. But there was still something in the way that the, the people within them... I think that's what I keep trying to keep hold of is the way that the models look engaged in it. Um, mm-hmm. And for I know this is radio, but... That's what the cover looks like. Oh, well, we will... Oh, beautiful. That's cool. Well, we will put a picture up of that on our Instagram Brilliant. as well, so for our listeners. Cool. Um, Jim, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thank um, you so much, both of you. It's been nice. Oh, no, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, really, really happy to have you on. So um, thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you very much for listening to the latest episode. Uh, If you'd like to read more about the episode or see the show notes, you can go over to the website, which is exposednegative.com. And to get in touch with us, there's a myriad of options. So you can either email us at info at exposednegative. You can follow us on Instagram at xnegative. We're on Twitter as well. But also, if you'd like to follow us personally, I mean, why wouldn't you? We're at at tombarns.com. That's D-O-T-C-O-M. And we're at Greg Fennell, which is G-R-E-G, obviously, uh, F-U-N-N-E-L-L. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to, uh, well, we won't see you on the next one, but hopefully you enjoy listening to it.